Uh, okay, so um, welcome everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, let's begin. Um, so far, you've heard from Neil and friends, and they've told you a lot about um, this interesting evolution of concepts that led us up to this point where we have um, neural networks that have been scaled up, they're starting to do really interesting tasks. Um, but there's one important ingredient that we haven't yet talked about, and um, that really uh, underpins, at least in my opinion, underpins much of the work. And that is this um, ecosystem of hardware and by extension software around the hardware that enables these neural networks to actually thrive. So um, the role that hardware plays in the game is that for all the tasks that you've heard about in the commercial space, uh, or these exciting sort of breakthroughs in the scientific space. So, you know, things like AlphaGo or um, perhaps deep learning models being able to do very well on sort of image tasks and so forth. They're only possible when you scale the architectures up to extremely large sizes. So friends mentioned, for example, that we're hitting sort of trillion parameter models. Um, and it, it, only, it, this is only possible through hardware acceleration in a software ecosystem that at least these things be done um, in an efficient way. Without hardware, you couldn't train these very large models. They couldn't consume the huge amounts of data that are both necessary ingredients for them to do these tasks. And so and for this reason, hardware is um, oddly essential for this sort of area of machine learning, which is why we're talking about it in the, the core of the first sort of five lectures that we um, cover. So um, I really like this stuff, so I'm very excited to talk about it. Um, let's begin. I want to begin by, by pointing out that um, hardware actually has always been a sort of deeply intertwined uh, with the evolution of neural networks. So if you remember, um, Neil talked about in the first lecture, a few of these sort of characters throughout history. And one of those characters was um, Rosenplatt. Rosenblatt um, at Cornell, he developed this idea of a perceptron. Um, and so I was looking around and I saw this article in the New York Times in, in 1958, so a long time ago. And if you read the text, not only did we discover that um, overhyping of neural networks is no, by no means a sort of a, a recent phenomenon, because you'll see there, for example, we're talking about this perceptron um, being able to, at the bottom there, being able to read and write in the very near future. And we know that never came to pass, right? Um, but why I picked this out was that we also see that he's testing these ideas out on extremely um, large scale hardware of that time. So he's using hardware, for example, the Weather Bureau's 2 million US dollar um, super, I guess, supercomputer of that era to try these ideas out. And so 2 million US dollars back then is about 20 million uh, US dollars today. And so this is serious hardware that's being brought to bear to test these ideas out. Um, so that's in the 50s. Um, even if you look in the 80s. Um, so Neil also showed us this really nicely cropped image of, of animation of, of uh, Yang LeCun um, doing demonstrations of CNNs in the 80s, being able to be sort of able to um, recognize digits very robustly. And so what I want to show is that to enable those sort of demonstrations and underpinning a lot of that work was a decade of looking at hardware because Yang and the folks he worked with realized that for this type of technology to hit the mainstream, they are going to need purpose-built types of hardware. And so on the left-hand side here, we have a slide that Jan likes to put up, sometimes when the topics sort of align well, to talk about the hardware work that he also was involved in when he was at Bell Labs. And on the, I should start playing this, but on the, on the right-hand side, uh, we have a video where he's showing a demonstration, something like the one we saw from Neil, um, but it gives you a sense of like, there's a bunch of computers in the background doing a lot of heavy work to enable this sort of stuff to be possible. And it's uh, not just Jan, but you see as you came around, you see a room full of people sort of behind the scenes trying to do the whole sort of, the whole sort of stack of enabling these systems to be, to be possible. So that's sort of a, a roundabout way. I, you can watch the whole thing later, but essentially it's a roundabout way to say that um, hardware has never been more important than it is today in terms of machine learning of the sort of deep learning variety, but also it's always been present uh, in the background um, even in the early stages. Um, this figure, these two figures, tell a lot of really interesting information about where we are today. And so um, focus, uh, focus on the left-hand side. Um, this is a very um, commonly shown plot that gives us a sense of the scale of compute required to sort of pull off all these interesting types of neural systems that you've heard about. So I, I think if you look along this, um, let's see if I get the, the pointer, use the thingy, yeah. So if, so if you just cast your eye along these names, I imagine that many of these names uh, are familiar to those who are interested in this topic. Um, for example, who wants to tell me what um, VGG does as an architecture? Anyone know? I've got a chocolate if you do know. Yeah, 
Image yeah, there's image classification. Oh, Chucky just says chocolate. Uh, wow, cool. Um, yeah, so then, so all those uh, on the on the left hand side, we see a bunch of dots. Each of those dots is a neural system and architecture with some underpinning hardware that has enabled somewhat of a very sort of influential result throughout history. And, and this time here is not just like a small snippet of time. I'm not sort of cherry picking a little bit of a window and saying, hey, look, there's a trend. This is, uh, you know, seven, eight, nine years. Uh, it stops in 2019, but we can carry on up until present day. And what it shows us is that um, on the, on the y-axis is the actual amount of compute required to train these systems. And so um, on the x-axis is time, y-axis is log scale because, the com because computation is going to the roof. Um, so if, if, you, if you consider that picture, then consider the right. The right is showing us um, the availability of compute throughout many, many decades, extending all the way back to the 40s. And so, you know, back into the times of the perceptron, all the way through, if you follow that line upwards, up until the very limit, what we get to is actually um, the amount of compute required to train just AlexNet. So one, one common thing that people ask is, oh, why did deep learning emerge just now in the 2010s and moving forward? Why did it emerge then? Well, it's because one simple answer is that the compute required to pull off the types of outcomes that we saw beginning with AlexNet never existed before. It was absolutely absent. Um, the other thing it shows us is, is another trend another um, sort of a, a trend of growth. So if you, if you sort of watch this sort of line up here, it'll, it'll approximate a very famous uh, law in, in computer science. Who, wants, who knows what that law is? Yeah, Moore's law. Yeah, who said that? Okay, I can, I guess I'll try this. Let's, uh... Oh, okay. Um, so Moore's law is um, sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy that we've been trying to hit for for many years where we want to double compute every 18 to 24 months. It's a sort of exponential growth that computer science is sort of famous for, because if you keep on doing that long enough, um, you can do amazing, amazing things. You know, compute starts dropping through the floor in terms of cost, and then you start using it for everything, right? So but what is interesting is that the, the Moore's law rate of growth is, you know, um, people commonly talk about as, as a very, very fast rate of growth. Um, if we compare it to the rate of computation required um, by these deep learning systems. On the other hand, the deep learning systems that we've been seeing uh, is, is, are doubling in terms of the requirements of their compute every three months. And they've been doing this, again, not for a few months that I can sort of just make a pretty story about, they've been doing it now for almost a decade. And so this trend, at least until something substantial happens in the fundamentals, is here to stay for, for, for a while. Um, and so one of the, what you should think about, we're gonna talk about some hardware and how it can do really amazing things and so forth. But one of the big wins and interesting stories here is that um, these systems that we saw from AlexNet moving forward, arguably would be impossible without breakthroughs in hardware and software. Um, so because of, without breakthroughs in hardware and software that, that sort of started once people realized the potential of deep learning systems, they started to say, okay, this is serious now. I'm gonna put a lot of inten intellectual energy into designing a chip and designing and software they would support these giant neural networks. And along the way, they've come up with really interesting sort of techniques for doing this. If they hadn't done this, then, um, and if we just chugged along at Moore's law, uh, all of these systems here would have been impossible, right? Because Moore's law, if I plot it along here, um, is gonna be about 0.1. So if you just cast my, look at this cursor here, uh, you, it was gonna, it's gonna be sort of a very sort of lower gradient. And so none of these systems here would have been able to be satisfied. So this is very really important. Um, yeah. One, yeah, one final thing extending on this thing, um, the machine learning and its demands as a workload has reinvigorated the area of hardware research. And so if you go along to any of these conferences, um, there's now many, many sessions dedicated to finding really deep insights about how we can redesign hardware to support these things. So there's a lot of, of sort of yeah, intellectual energy going to make this work. And um, yeah, and so, and so the techniques we're talking today has been really been able to, to lift us beyond Moore's law and uh, support all these interesting breakthroughs that other folks have been um, making. Okay, so that's sort of the lay of the land. Let's talk about some hardware fundamentals in the context of machine learning. Um, so you can kind of get the sort of, um, so then, then the following topics we talk about make a, uh, make a little bit more sense. Um, but, but one thing I also want to sort of point out also is that, um, I would expect that ideas and deep learning will evolve, we'll have new types of optimization, we'll have new architectures, we might have even ideas we don't even see coming that is going to start to make some of the hardware concepts we're talking about today 
perhaps invalid or not as important as they are today. Um, but there are some concepts here that are likely to sort of stay with us even as we pivot around to new ideas. And so, and I was trying to think, what would those concepts be? Well, um, three concepts that I, I think are going to stand the test of time as we move forward, um, down to the others, and these are obviously somewhat debatable. The three concepts I would highlight is um, this idea of specialization. So um, the types of chips and the techniques and everything that supports deep learning, because Moore's law um, is unable to support the demand, uh, what we've had to deal with and, and go more towards increasingly is specializing the hardware and everything else to fit a very narrow specific set of tasks. And, we, and there's, this, uh, there's this principle that as you start to do specialization in this sort of space, you can get more and more and more efficient at a cost of not being able to support other types of workloads. So specialization, when a new brand new thing comes out, we'll probably have to, and, it, and it's, if it is computationally expensive, specialization is gonna play another role. Um, another idea is parallelization. So uh, to make all of this work, we're not, uh, we're not the, the, one of the main enablers is that the breaking down of all the different components required to do this computation and doing them at the same time. So that's a sort of a, a, a long standing sort of concept. And finally, there's this challenge of data movement that we're gonna talk about. And that's because uh, deep learning models, at least as they exist today, are very, very large. And especially in comparison to the types of memory architectures that we have to play with. And so as I'll be saying, uh, we've got to spread these models throughout the memory architecture and then as we need to move these things up and down in the, in the, in sort of the memory hierarchy, there's a lot of cost to be paid for this movement. And so trying to mask and hide this latency is one of the main principles to enable these things to be executed efficiently. So those three principles that we're gonna go through. Um, let's talk about this, this slide, let's just look at specialization and parallelism all in one go and two chips that you're probably very familiar with. Um, one is a CPU, one is a GPU. Uh, the CPU is on the uh, left. And it's characterized by having a low number of cores and a lot of complexity in how it manages its, its memory hierarchy. It's sort of basically the Swiss army knife of compute. You throw any architecture, any sort of algorithm at it, it's gonna do pretty well at it. Um, in contrast is the GPU. And this answers this question of like, why is the GPU so useful in deep learning? Because it instead has invested its sort of very valuable um, chip die space on having lots and lots of relatively simple cores. These are the green um, little squares that you see. Um, and at the expense of having a memory hierarchy that's very programmable. So it's not going all the way down to being specific to a deep learning technique, but what it does do is it is um, excellent at doing any type of parallel computation uh, um, because it can use all of its cores and it has an explicitly programmed memory um, management system. So that depending on what massive parallel tasks you want to do, it is able to support that. Um, later on in this lecture, we're gonna talk about even further specialization, things that are often called uh, NPU, so neural processing units, um, or another, another term is essentially ASICs or chips that are designed specifically for deep learning. And we'll see how this contrasts in this picture. But these, these, so these are the two sort of big um, spectrums of design that we have. And, this, and the reason why CPUs are are not particularly useful for deep learning is, is what I've been saying so far. It's, in a, it's the inability to parallelize massively. Uh, let's talk about um, the bigger picture of these systems. Those are chips. Let's think, think about the bigger picture in the system. It's gonna have a lot of different components, the chips, the memory, the, the storage, the network for communicating, all these things are connected. And so when I was talking about data movement before, they're connected by different types of buses that run at different types of speeds. Um, and, and because deep learning has to be spread throughout these systems for when it runs, for example, the training data is so massive, it's got to sit on stable storage, it's got to sit on SSD, the latency between these things become relevant. Um, so the whole design of the system is also critical to the efficiency. And then this gives us a sort of a, a typical kind, kind, of, kind of view of um, the memory hierarchy. And so in most systems, you'll see this type of thing occurring where you have the fast memory that's very close to the chip where eventually the inputs have to get to before they can be operated on, on by the processor um, is small. And then the um, conventionally, the, 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 the larger memory that you have, even down to storage, is, is larger, but it's slower. And so um, that this gives us sort of a quick idea of, of what this trade-off is. Um, but let me show you two slides. Um, for first of it, at first it sort of provides us with some numbers. Um, to conventional models. And I guess this, uh, I tried to make it sort of grayscale, but I think it's ruined the key. Um, let's focus on the left-hand side. 
it's a ResNet model. It's a, it's a, um, it's assuming we're going to train on Safari 10, and then it's showing you what are the different types of, of um, objects that we have to deal with um, during training. And it shows you that I've been talking about large parameter sizes and so on, and that's taking a lot of space. But in fact, when you're trying to do training, um, it, it goes beyond just the requirements of holding and describing the model. Uh, that's only the kind of small sliver. This is not very good, but yeah. But essentially, the recent example is showing us that the model takes up, um, in this case, 5.8 megabytes. So it's a relatively small model. But then um, to do training on the system, we also have to have state about the optimizer. So the different variations that friends are talking about optimization, uh, optimizers, they might have things like momentum and other things. These all incur bookkeeping that you have to kind of keep around as you're doing the calculations. And these can start to add up too. Um, also, you might not have thought, um, um, but the activations, so these nonlinear activations are also going to have state and they're going to have to be kept around because later on we have to calculate the gradients. And so that can also have a sort of overwhelming effect. All in sum, it can be a huge amount of memory. I want to kind of make it sort of very concrete about how much we're really talking about here. So hundreds of megabytes, if not gigabytes. Um, and then let's put some also some numbers to these, this uh, data movement cost. Um, so this is, um, this is a textbook description of the different costs of, 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 um, of moving data around um, the memory hierarchy. And what you should uh, sort of realize here is that the relative costs um, between different levels can sometimes be huge. So if you look at the, the speed difference, like this is the speed for the processor to access this bit of memory. So the speed to access L1 versus um, L2. So this is in the cache, right? You expect both to be very, very fast is a factor of 25 there. If you're talking about what's the difference of acting on memory versus acting on stable storage over uh, in this sort of uh, blue teal color, um, that's a factor of like 160 fold slower, right? And then so if you think about um, model sizes being in the hundreds, uh, training set like ImageNet, could, you could, it could be like 150 gigabytes very easily. So you have to spread this throughout. And then um, one of the key things for efficiency is um, understanding where to place uh, the data and then moving this data around as the algorithms uh, occur such that you're not going to have this effect of the compute stalling and not being able to do anything while it waits for data to come in. So yeah. let's talk about now about um, parallelism. It's, an, it's a really important sort of primitive for us to be able to do this work very, very quickly. Um, and, and interestingly, uh, parallelism is, is, is normally very complicated. So um, there, there are folks in the computer lab, for example, like, uh, like Tim Jones, um, who, who, who study how do you break you know, arbitrary programs in, in, into small chunks that can be paralyzed and put onto a GPU. Um, in this particular context, we are so lucky because what we want to run is relatively simple types of operations that have um, lots and lots of inherent parallelism within them. If it was some arbitrary sort of more complex algorithm, we really could be limited in terms of what we can do in parallel. Because if there's a dependencies between these things, you just can't do as much parallelism as we're able to do. Um, let's first look at um, the opportunities for parallelism. And then this equation here is uh, just a simple model update uh, that's using some notation that's a little bit different to what friends um, showed us uh, on Tuesday, um, but essentially saying the same thing. This is a, a single um, model update and when you're doing it sort of with a gradient um, descent, and this is, and this is, um, if we just go through the notation here. So, so there's G, uh, this G term here that's talking about um, uh, calculating the gradients between examples. This lowercase b is an individual uh, example within a, within a batch, where the batch is the big B. And then we're, um, then we're just going to average the gradients over, um, over the collection of, of the mini batch. And then we're going to um, apply the, um, the gradient, uh, we're going to apply the update to the existing uh, model uh, weights and, 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 and settings of the model, and then we're going to update it in the next iteration, just go around like this. And so then just to show you, um, I put up his equation here, which is like a general, general form of that, right? And so I rewrote this because I just wanted to highlight there's many opportunities for parallelism when you're doing this um, model update, which is the typical sort of heavy bit of the, the task. There's many different tasks we could talk about, but we're gonna talk about the, the things that cost the, the most because they're most frequently done. Uh, so where are these opportunities for parallelism? Well, the first of these uh, is when we're calculating the gradients. To calculate these gradients, we're gonna have lots and lots and lots of 
matrix multiplications that need to be done, they can all be done independently of each other in parallel. So that's, that's one example. Another example is that um, we uh, are doing, um, there's these mini batches, right? Each of these individual examples can be, have these gradients computed in parallel of each other too. So we don't have to um, do the different examples in sequence, we can do them all at the same time. Uh, number three, um, we can have lots of mini batches to um, do, right? We're gonna break up the training set into many, many batches, and then we're gonna apply the model updates. Each of these batches can be uh, computed in parallel of each other and then, then applied, right? So that's another opportunity for parallelism. Um, finally, um, things like learning rates and, and many different types of, of hyperparameters can have a huge influence in terms of the end uh, result and quality of your model. And so what folks do is they train with lots of different types of um, hyperparameters in very similar settings by just tweaking one thing, uh, learning rate being a very common, th common one of these. And this is another example of how we can do all these things in parallel. So hopefully, hopefully I've convinced you that there's a lot of opportunity for parallelism here. Uh, the next question is how are we going to, to exploit this potential? And again, so we're going to come back to our friend, the GPU. It's the most common, uh, readily available source of a processor that can really cope with this, these opportunities. Um, most of the operations that we're talking about um, end up boiling down to um, matrix multiplication. And then so um, within GPUs, it's, it's not trivial to, to get to, to sort of exercise this uh, opportunity to run in parallel. And that's because as I was mentioning, um, one of the hardest things is to make sure that although we have all of these different cores that, that can run in parallel, you need to be able to feed them well. So if there's any point in the execution where a single one of these um, uh, cores doesn't have the input it needs, it's gonna wait. And so um, a lot of work goes in to designing where the data is going to be and how it's gonna be rearranged throughout the, the cache and the memory so that none of these processes store. Uh, what we're seeing here is um, this middle figure here is, is one way to do matrix multiplication in a more naive way. And if you do it in this way, which is something along the lines of what you see in high school, where you're sort of doing, you know, um, row by column and you're computing on one, um, one output at a time, uh, what, it, what happens in, in, in the case of the GPU is it's going to store. And so what they actually do in practice is they do something called block um, multiplication. And so what they do is they, instead of computing it all the way, all the way to the end result, they block the, the big matrices into individual blocks where they can compute the intermediate results and uh, they um, keep all the information needed for a single block and shared memory that is tied to a cluster of, of, of cores. And they, have a, a, and they have a series of cluster of cores. And uh, now what they do is they go from block to block to block to block, and at the end they sum it all up. And so by doing it um, in block wise, uh, you get a lot of reuse for the inputs. And then by doing it in this manner, um, you don't have stalling happening in your, in your GPU. So that's one sort of simple way that, that folks do this to keep all the different cores operating and being able to do the um, massive multiplications all in one go without the cores um, stalling. Um, to tune to tune that sort of approach is actually very tricky. It's, uh, it's dependent on the, the memory sizes available inside the, the system. So how much memory do you have in your GPU? How much is the memory available to these thread blocks? How much memory is available to the individual um, units of compute? How big are the data structures you need to, to deal with? For example, how big are these mini batches? All these things uh, affect the performance and the, and the parameterization of this blockwise multiplication. And so what you're seeing here is, is an interesting phenomena whereby if you um, make a mistake with this parameterization, you get massive drops in performance. And so I took this from um, an NVIDIA um, tech report that tells us about you know, how to squeeze out the most um, performance out of my GPU. And if you take a look at, for example, um, this is this figure on the left hand side, I can explain this. Um, y axis is the, the, the number of floating point operations that the, that the um, process is able to sort of pump out. So it's a measure of, of how much um, work is it doing. Uh, the x axis is just the size of the blocks. And above, it's going to tell us a particular type of approach for doing the matrix multiplications and a few other parameters. But the thing to note is that for this particular experiment, um, as they um, as they uh, change the, the size of the blocks, whenever they um, reach some parameters, 
that are, that, that do not align well with effectively using the memory and, 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 and compute starts to stall, you see the performance drops like a rock. So like if we're at the sort of 128 level, and if I, and if I change that to something like 129, notice how the, the performance, the throughput of this processor just drops. Right? And so then these are very sensitive types of, of, of systems. And so it's not trivial at all to get this massive parallelization effect through these systems at all. Um, so that's the, that's the takeaway. Now, a, a sing, a, a, the next step to think about is that a single GPU alone, or even a couple of them, is not really going to be enough for training in a, in a sort of short order uh, these very large scale models. And so I want to also point out that in actuality for us to train, um, while, we, while we're talking about in this class, talking about optimizing a single GPU and trying to get a lot of performance out of it, um, to, to train large scale non-toy models, you actually have to link a number of GPU systems all together and essentially replicate the same type of problem where you want to understand how am I going to break up this large model, spread it through these different GPU systems, and then have the algorithms run in such a way that uh, I'm minimizing the stalling that happens across all, this, all these systems at once. So you kind of have a hierarchical problem. You want to solve the same sort of set of problems, the same sort of flavor of problems on a single machine for a single GPU. You solve that, and then you want to solve it for exactly, again, for a network of these things to, to combine together. And um, when you can do that properly, you can have them all running um, well in parallel, and you could do these massive training tasks in, in, in days instead of months and weeks. Um, right, I could have just talked about that. Um, so now let's talk about uh, data movement, the second challenge. Uh, to talk about data movement, I could go back to the GPU and tell you how, um, how does it deal with these data movement issues that I was talking about before to achieve this parallelism. Um, but I only wanted to sort of touch upon that so then we could transition and talk more about NPU design. But I just wanted to sort of say that as a result of the design of, of, of a GPU, because it has massive amounts of, of, of um, simple compute, each with its own tiny amount of memory, uh, one effect that the design has is that it produces a, a very unusual looking memory hierarchy. On the left hand side is what you often would see in a textbook because they're typically tied to things like CPUs. And so you have this, this illustration that I showed earlier of like the fast memory being in small um, and the large memory being, uh, the, the, the far away memory being, being large. But what, uh, what, C, uh, what GPUs are able to pull off through their design is something quite unusual. Of course, they can't have this sort of magical outcome where all the memory is large and fast, um, but what they can do is have this sort of bottleneck design. Whereas because they have so many cores and each core has a tiny amount of memory, the sum of the fast memory is actually very large. Um, it's completely unlike what you see in other types of compute. And then of course, there's gotta be some trade-off. So the shared memory is a bit smaller and see so this hourglass happening. And of course, stable storage and the large sort of um, off-chip memory of the GPU is still very large as well. But as it's, ne it's this necessary sort of outcome that, that makes uh, it possible to do this parallelism and minimizes the, the outcomes of data movement, the sort of the challenges of it. Um, but I don't wanna to say too much about this particular system because I wanted to talk about um, this problem in, uh, with respect to, to TPUs. But before I get to TPUs and MPUs and so forth, these more specialist designs, I've been talking a lot, I want to actually show you some code. And so this code is um, showing you a, a way to profile our models. So we can see, for example, where all the memory goes, and then we can see how, you know, how does this map to the memory system. Um, so let me just see if this works. And then I'm gonna show you uh, also, the reason I'm gonna show you this is I want to show you um, a tangible example of this problem occurring. So let's see if this works. This thing? Yeah. This thing. So you can, you can use this later, but um, this is showing us, uh, I'm gonna import the AlexNet model uh, I run this with, through some helper functions. And what this does is for a single inference, it profiles for each layer, uh, how much memory is required. And so then you can, um, you can see that the, the original picture that I showed you earlier on the, um, in, the, in the slides had a very summarized view of activations and so on. Um, this can show us a much more nuanced view and what it shows us is as we progress through these architectures, and we'll be hearing more about what these layer types are in subsequent lectures, 
But uh, as you go from layer to layer to layer, um, the memory uh, required actually fluctuates a lot. Um, the, color co um, the color coding here is uh, red, uh, our inputs. So each time you hit a layer, I've got to provide it with some inputs. So I've got to uh, keep that memory around. And at the very start and initial layer, of course, it can be very large because it's often maybe a picture or an audio file of some kind. Um, then I'm going to need space for the output. And then I'm going to need space also for the, the um, parameters itself. And often the parameters in, in this particular case are dwarfed by the other two. And what you can see is that this, the memory requirements of actually performing, uh, in this case, inference, but it'll be similar effect in training. You can have the, it's a very complicated picture because as you go from layer to layer to layer, that the memory requirements are, are often fluctuating up and down, up and down. Um, now, when we go through this code, um, yeah, you can see how there's a slightly more, um, this is for training. So there's a lot of other different types of, of colors there. We can go through it uh, later. But um, what I want to show is um, a tangible example of us uh, having a data movement problem. And so for this, I've, uh, what I've done is taken AlexNet and then I've um, come up with different variations of AlexNet that are uh, increasing in width. So I'm adding more neurons essentially to the layer. And then what I'm trying to do here is, uh, can I find a tipping point in my system for what the Colab is running on, such that when I get a little bit bigger, I suddenly have to not use nearby fast memory, but have to also start using some other subsystem of memory that's going to take a lot longer to execute. And then you would, what you're going to see is that the, the time to do this additional work is a lot more than what, what you'd normally expect. And so when we go through this code at the bottom here, um, and I plot it. The, the first version is uh, AlexNet, where I've increased the, the width of the network by 50%, this is what 0 0.5 means. And then I've, I've timed it for doing um, inference. So then the next time I, um, I double it and I see how much it's gonna cost me. So, okay, doubling the, the, the width of the network, okay. It uh, looks like it's cost me something like double in terms of the inference time. That makes sense, right? I've doubled the number of neurons, so it should cost double amount of time. Look what happens if I double it again. And that's what I've done here. I double it again, but the cost has, has gone up much more than double. I've gone from five to, to 12, right? So I've paid an outsized amount of cost, even though my compute should only doubled, I've paid a lot more in terms of um, the inference time. And then the, the reason for this is not because the amount of compute required has, ex, has grown uh, unusually, unexpectedly, it's as we would expect. Um, but the, the trouble here is that the amount of space required is such that I'm no longer operating in fast memory. I'm just using these terms very loosely, but not fast, local, close to me memory. I've now had to um, start to touch further away memory that can, that can cause a huge penalty because I have to go and bring these things into me before I can compute. So that's, that's data movement work at work. So how do we um, deal with these things? So I've talked about how we deal with these things in the context of, of GPUs. It turns out that, uh, this, I press the button? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, when we start talking about uh, uh, this, this third class of compute support for deep learning, this, uh, these ideas of neural processing units. Um, in this area, we allow ourselves to design processes specifically uh, with these algorithms in mind. So that they don't have to do anything else. But, you know, GPU has to be able to do any sort of type of um, general purpose parallel type of processing, right? These chips are going to special, specially design to do things like matrix multiplication very fast. And when we do that, we can approach this problem of um, data movement in a different way. And so there is this well-known idea, this sort of design principle called systolic arrays that have been around since the late 80s. And uh, the whole idea can be summarized in these two little figures that you see on the left that I took from the original paper. The idea is that these, they stand for processing elements. So that you can imagine there's this logical grouping, uh, uh, one single logical um, processor. Now, we have to deal with uh, data movement if I have a single processing element doing the work, I have, to, I have to pay this sort of latency, whatever it is, of getting this data from memory into the processor to do the work. If I'm actually able to design the processor from scratch to, to fulfill just a specific algorithm, what I can do 
is start to interconnect processing elements together. So these are compute units where I hardwire the logic that occurs. So the output of uh, one is the input to the next. And if I can do this in, in different ways, I can actually save the need to actually touch memory at all. All I need to do is uh, get the inputs once and then feed the, you know, the, through the different stages of the algorithm, um, the output of one um, into, the, into the input of the next. And then what happens is that you enter this area of designing topologies of uh, processing elements and hardwiring them together, where one where a transition from one goes to the transition of another to do simple operations such that I can execute the algorithm that I need to run um, through sort of a network of processing units. And so this is the idea of um, systolic arrays. You can design, um, you can't design a systolic array for any type of algorithm. Um, it has to be one where the individual operations are quite simple and you can design this sort of mesh whereby you know, going from one place to the next on different types of elements can, can, can perform the type of work they want to do. And so if I just play this um, animation here, you can see how a systolic array looks like if it's doing um, matrix multiplication. Um, the gray guys, these gray circles are processing elements where we can associate a small amount of memory to store um, individual parts of the weights. And so you can imagine these processing elements sitting there, they store inside them uh, different parts of the, the neural network we want to do, um, we want to support. And then all we need to do is we have the input arrive at the different processing elements. And then once the different parts of the inputs arrive at the processing elements, they're hardwired to know what to do next. So for example, in this particular um, design, um, these weights, are these, these uh, gray circles know that they, for, for example, in some directions they have to perform a dot product, in other directions they have to perform a sum. And so by just feeding the data in, it, it, it immediately feeds out the output without any interaction with the memory subsystem. And so the reason I've talked about this is that um, variations on this design are actually what is often used as sort of the workhorse in all these different types of um, neural processing units that you would have seen, some of which are in your phones and some of which are in these big data centers that perform um, uh, deep learning training. Um, and so one place where you see the systolic array, the sort of design pattern being used is in probably what is uh, the most famous um, NPU of the most thus far, and that is the TPU, um, developed by Google. And so let's look at this sort of diagram. I want to show you this as a contrast to what we saw with the CPU and the GPU. Um, it's a bit more complicated because it's a bit more realistic, but don't freak out. Left-hand side is like a data um, flow view of the TPU. Uh, Right-hand side is a view where um, you get a sense of relative sizes of how they've used the die. Uh, and, and, and both the views are quite important. Um, there's a couple of takeaways here. Um, one is, do I have a pointer? Oh, I got this thing, yeah. So, yeah. One thing to note is um, here we have um, matrix multiply unit that's been designed using the Sasolica array principle. And because in this design, not only do you have to not interact with memory very much, but all the control suddenly disappears. So you can design much, much larger um, uh, collections of processing elements then you can otherwise build even in a GPU. So we, in a GPU, you can talk about, um, well, they used to talk about hundreds and perhaps thousands of cores. In this particular uh, Sasolic array, we have 64,000 simple processing elements all working together. Uh, and that's, that's possible because we've reduced the logic and we've hard coded, if you will, the, the, the execution of an algorithm to do matrix multiply. The other thing I want to point out is that um, the TPU is sort of a lesson in um, extreme specialization. Um, you'll see here different types of compute units labeled um, very obviously for different types of um, uh, neural architecture components. So they have um, this big systolic array that doing um, matrix multiply heavy lifting, but they, then they also have um, specific um, compute uh, just for supporting things like activation, because they can, they know that there's certain types of operations that are going to be done by activation. So when we're doing it, we're just we're doing that part of the processing. We're going to have a specialist compute just there um, with very simple logic just to perform the operations we know that are required. Um, and uh, we have the same thing for doing, we have a specific type of com uh, compute just on the chip for doing things like normalization and pooling. 
The other thing that you notice is in the memory structure, it's a little bit hard to see, but I, let me point you out, I point out two things. Up here, we have memory that's related to storing the weights of the processor. And so we can see here that this memory um, feeds into the, the um, systolic array, um, but at a, at, a, at a fairly low data rate. And that's because they know that it's gonna be fairly infrequent that they're gonna change one model for the other. This, 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 this design is a simpler one that's designed specifically for doing inference very fast. So, you know, um, when Google deploys this to a data center and they want to run, um, they will, they'll have to deploy, for example, a, a, an ASR model, and so a speech recognition model, and then they know that they're not gonna update that speech recognition model that frequently relative to the amount of inferences that we're gonna run through it. They're gonna have lots and lots of examples going through getting the results, but they're not gonna change the model very frequently. So they designed the, the memory, this part of the memory subsystem um, to be a size that accommodates um, the, the weights necessary for the model. And then the, the throughput into the um, solid array is relatively small. So this is, look at this number compared to this number here right 30 versus 167 so one there's a much faster bus going to another part of memory and that's assigned for activation and obviously because if i'm supporting inference i'm constantly changing those values as i do that as i go from layer to layer to layer and compute these activations so activation um you know activation not only is large but the but they've designed the chip in a way that the the bus that connects those two components are, are much much faster um, so those, those are examples of, of things they did specifically to support um, this type of processing, and it wouldn't, you know, it's essentially useless for doing anything else. Um, yeah. Let me show you another example in code. You can see this later on. These are all collabs. You can run it on your browser whenever you want. I just wanted to show you these relative comparisons between a, a CPU, a, a GPU, and a, a TPU. So let me just do that so you can see um, just how big of gains we're talking about. Hopefully it hasn't timed out. So, oops, it did. Um, what time? I'm a little, let, me just, let me just show you the values. <laughs> so you can always play with this later. But um, here we, sorry, 10 minutes. Yeah, uh, yeah I'm still just gonna go quickly just to show you that, okay. So we have these, um, random numbers, and we're gonna do this timing loop to see how long it takes on a, on a CPU. Um, so you can, you can test this out, and you, in this particular instance, I got um, 30 seconds for these two massive arrays. Um, if I go down, I have an example of a GPU, and you can see that what took 30 seconds for the CPU took uh, you know, 0 0.08 seconds on the on the cp on the gpu now this is not an apples with apples comparison obviously the you know the, the type of um well it's very hard to it's hard to actually measure um between two radically different micro architectures but these are, these are very different chips but you can see you've got a choice of going a and b and one is much much faster um if i go to the the tpu example and it's oops What's interesting is all of these resources available to you. You can't train huge models, but you, but you can sort of play around and experiment with these different hardwares available. Um, what I can show you is, oh. Mm -hmm. oh. Well, I'll, I'll run this at the end and then we can, it, it takes a couple of minutes to initialize and we can run it. But essentially uh, we see a value that looks like uh, this. So 0 0.003. So we're talking about orders of magnitude faster for doing the same type of, of work, right? So this is, this is the specialization at play. Um, I wanted to, to do that a little bit quickly just to have um, time to be able to uh, wrap up and, and express a couple of final uh, messages that I think are pretty important. Um, so message number one is that uh, this has been a very hardware centric view and it's somewhat deliberate, but there's a much bigger um, uh, set of stories I could have told you related to the software and algorithmic techniques for um, efficiency. Um, but one thing I want you to sort of understand is that we've talked about things in a very raw form, but most of the time as a developer or as, as sort of a, as a practitioner of these deep models, there's a, an ecosystem of, of software stack 
that um, protects you from all these gory details. So uh, probably with equal importance as um, auto diff is that these um, stacks also manage all of this um, performance issues for you. So they make very clever decisions about which GPU and how you're going to parameterize it and even which sort of way you're going to do matrix mult for different examples. They make those decisions for you so you can get you know, relatively good performance without doing any heavy lifting. And those are some of the main benefits of using um, uh, software like PyTorch and so on and, this, and the underlying sort of um, lower level embedded libraries that are there as well. Um, and so, so you, you might not realize but when you're using um, PyTorch, it's making fairly sophisticated decisions for you. Um, so one example is, uh, is that it literally knows many different ways to do matrix multiplication. It's going to look at the uh, inputs that you're giving it and make a decision. And even if it's uncertain about the decision, it'll actually do sometimes probing. So it'll run a few epochs or if, um, a few examples of what you're doing. It'll probe to see what sort of behavior it sees from the, um, from the hardware that you have and the algorithm that thinks is gonna work well. And it could even pivot to other options to make sure the subsequent iterations work even faster. So there's a lot of things happening under the hood that's really important for performance. So that unless you're really doing something unusual, you get a lot of these things for free. So that's important point number one. Um, the other point I wanted to make was, um, there's this really interesting um, uh, sort of white paper. This is the latest version of the um, communications of the ACM. So if you're interested in the library or have it, or you can have my copy. Um, there's a, it's a, it, it describes this notion of software lotteries that I want to make sure they got across to you. And so what we live in right now is what you call, what, what the author, Sarah Hooker, would define as a software lottery. And so what that means is that um, because of historical decisions about how you want to optimize the software and hardware stack, certain things are now very, very fast because there's been a huge amount of investment in hardware and software to support certain operations. But intrinsically, there are other operations that are no more or less um, compute heavy it's just that they are not going to be nearly anywhere nearly um, performant as the ones that we've been kind of streamlined for. And so you can kind of think of it as a um, as tunnel vision. There's certain type of, of, particularly in the area of machine learning, there's certain types of architectures and designs for optimizers and so on that are going to just fly underpinned by hardware and software. And so that this really is limiting the scope of what works and sometimes uh, what works um, efficiently. And then and for no real fault of other other explorations um, that you might come up with, they're just not going to be anywhere performant because there's, there's the lack of hardware support for them. So, so the lottery part of this is that there are certain winners that are being selected, um, not because they're uh, fundamentally a better idea, but just because that they are more efficient because of the sort of the, the background of where the hardware happens to have gone. And so one of the open questions for the whole community is that how do you um, incentivize and enable people to explore at the borders and even further, even, especially in the areas where um, we're not sure if something's a good idea until you start to scale it up. And if the hardware is not there, how do you explore that? And so I just want to emphasize the point that what is fast right now is not really a function in all ways of how complex it is, but often it's, it's a function of, of, of how much effort has gone on to optimize that um, moving uh, forward. So that is essentially right on time. Um, yeah, thanks for listening today. I think the next lecture we have is uh, going to be a summarization of, of, of where we've got so far. So you can ask us all the different questions you might have uh, and we'll sort of um, also review the material that we've gone on so far. Um, any questions? Okay, thanks very much. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, when you have those two different tool applications, uh, can you show how one of them has how do you toggle? Yeah, how do you? Yeah, I can do that. Um, yeah, it's just about the. Um, let's see. Well, you you um, select the hardware. I think from one of these options. Yeah, that's, that's what I was. If, yeah, change runtime type. Yeah, change runtime type. And so you can pick the one that you want. Um, oh, oh, yeah, I forgot. So yeah, if, on the GPU instance, I mean, your GPU can't survive without a CPU. So that if you grab a GPU in, in, instance, you can run some of the code on CPU to get the measurement. Um, so you can toggle between GPU and 
and CPU. Um, yeah. And there's also these cool functions for like probing what the hardware is. So interestingly, when you run CoLab a few times, you're not always guaranteed which particular system you're going to get. So you might want to probe it and see oh, which GPU I get, because you might run it once, get one figure, run it again, get a completely different figure and wonder what's going on. So you can um, see what's going on, you see what's happening. And what, one interesting thing I found when I was trying to do the um, data movement example was that um, it'll actually uh, change hardware underneath uh, based on what you're running. So for a few times I was running and I couldn't get any sort of effect and I thought what's going on. It was actually because it was pivoting from one hardware to another when it saw that what, a different type of hardware was needed. So it was pretty smart actually. Um, yeah. Oh yeah, Christian's back. Can you share these notebooks? Yeah, yeah, I can, uh, um, yeah, I'll share these notebooks and the, and the slides on the same page so you guys can play. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, thanks very much.